Family of Liars, written by E. Lockhart, read by Brittany George. Chapter 7. Our island is quite a ways off the coast of Massachusetts. The water is a deep, dark blue. Sometimes there are great white sharks off the shore. Beach roses flourish here. The island is covered with them. And though the shoreline is rocky, we have two sweet inlets edged with patches of white sand. At first, this land belonged to indigenous people. It was taken away from them by settlers from Europe. Nobody knows when, but it must have happened. In 1926, my great-grandfather bought the island and built a single home on the south shore. His son inherited it, and when he died in 1972, my father and his brother Dean inherited it. And they had plans. The Sinclair brothers demolished the home their grandfather had built. They leveled the land where needed. They charted in sand for the island's beaches. They consulted with architects and built three houses, one for each brother, plus a guest house. The homes were traditional Cape Cod style, steep roofs, wood shingles, shutters on the windows, big porches. Some of the money for these projects came from my mother's trust fund. Tipper's family money came, in part, going back some generations from a sugar plantation near Charleston, South Carolina. That plantation used enslaved people for labor. It is ugly money. Other money came from my father's family. The Sinclairs were owners of a long-standing Boston publishing house, and more came from my father. Early in his career, Harris bought a small company that puts out a number of literary and news magazines. That's ugly money too, just in different ways. The history there includes exploited workers, broken contracts, and child labor overseas, along with journalistic integrity and belief in the freedom of the press. When the Sinclair brothers were done with their improvements, there were two docks, a boathouse, and a staff building. The island was crisscrossed with wooden walkways and planted with lilacs and lavender. I have spent every summer here since I was five. It is June now, 1987, the summer the boys arrive, the summer of Feth. We drive from Boston to the Cape. Gerard, the Beechwood groundskeeper, meets us in the town of Woods Hole. He has brought the big motorboat. Gerard is about 60 years old, short and smiley. He says very little except to my mother. She has eager questions about the flowers and lilacs, various repairs that are needed, and the installation of the new dryer. In a few days, Luda will take a rental car down with more stuff from the Boston house. With the boat loaded up, we motor two hours to the island with Gerard at the wheel. Penny, Bess, and I sit together, our hair whipping around us. It is the same ride as every year, only without Rosemary in her orange life vest. Without her. Claremont House looks the same as ever. Three stories and a turret up top. The wooden shingles are gray from salt air. A wide porch stretches around two sides. There is a hammock on one end of the porch and a collection of cozy armchairs on the other. On the lawn is an extra large custom-made picnic table. We eat supper there most nights. At the foot of the lawn stands a maple tree. From a low branch hangs our tire swing on a single thick rope. Coming up from the dock, Penny throws her suitcases on the lawn and runs to the swing. She hurls herself onto it and spins wildly. Carrie, get over here. You need to say hello to the swing, she calls. Okay then. I'm feeling melancholy, thinking of Rosemary, but I go over anyhow. I run and climb on, standing with my feet on either side of Penny's legs. The rush of the air in my ears, the dizziness. For a moment, I forget everything but this. It's summer now, cries Penny. When Bess gets up from the dock, she leaves her bags and comes to join us. We are too big and it's hard to fit, but we get gloriously dizzy together, the way we did when we were children. Inside Claremont, the carpets are worn, but the woodwork is oiled. The kitchen's round table boasts the stains and scrapes that are inevitable with a big family. The living room features a number of oil paintings and a bar cart glistening with bottles, but the den is more comfortable. It bursts with books and blankets, plaid flannel dog beds, and stacks of newspaper. There's a study for my father, filled with framed New Yorker cartoons and fat leather furniture and a crafting studio for my mother. All quilting fabrics and jars of buttons, calligraphy pens, and boxes of pretty stationery. My parents' room is on the third floor, away from the noise of us girls. When I go in, about half an hour after the arrival, Tipper is unpacking, sliding shirts into a drawer. Her beige linen dress is creased from traveling. Wharton, our Irish setter, stretches across the bottom of the bed. I lie down beside her. 
Make room, you dung queen of a dog. Oh, don't say that, scolds Tipper. She'll feel bad. Stupid is part of her charm. I stroke Wharton's soft ears. She's eating Harris's sock. My mother comes over and takes a sock from Wharton's mouth. That's not food, she tells the dog. Wharton looks up soulfully, then begins to lick the bedspread. Tipper putters from the dresser to the dressing table, in and out of the closet, and back and forth to her suitcase. When I was sick, we were often just the two of us, but since school ended, I have only seen my mother with my sisters around. She changes her dress and combs her hair at her dress dressing table. Come here. She pulls out a wide, shallow jewelry drawer lined with black felt. I keep things in here year-round, she says, touching her fingers to the pieces. That way, it's like getting presents every time I open this drawer. I forget what I have, and then it's like, oh, hello, aren't you pretty? The game like that is typical of Tipper. She looks for ways to squeeze any last drop of pleasure from a situation to create joy and surprise whenever she can. This was my granny's ring, she says, holding up a square-cut diamond. She goes on, pointing out pieces, ancient jade, and newer sapphires. She sets the treasure gingerly on the table so I may try them on. Each one is a piece of our feminine family history, stretching back through her lineage and Harris's. One is her engagement ring, an emerald surrounded by diamonds. My parents met at Harvard Radcliffe, where Har Harris proposed to Tipper four times before she said yes. I wore her down, he always tells us. She accepted me just to shut me up. My mother laughs when he tells the story. The fourth time you figured out to buy a ring, she reminds him. Now she pulls out a double strand of dark, glowing pearls, deep gray with galaxies spinning inside them. Your father bought these for our second anniversary when I was pregnant with you. She, get, she lets me hold them. They're slippery and heavier than I expected. She takes them back and clasps them around her neck where they glisten against her blue of her fresh dress. It was a very meaningful gift, she says. These weren't, things weren't easy back then. Why not? I can hardly remember. She reaches out to touch my cheek, but I'd like you to have them someday. Okay. The black pearls, she says, fingering them at her throat, are carries. Beneath the, the drawer liner, I catch a glimpse of a photo edged in white with faded orange color. I can see only the bottom right corner. What's the picture? I ask, reaching for it. She stops my hand. It's nothing. Is it Rosemary? A look crosses her face. Grief? No. I put my hands behind my back. I wanted to see if it was Rosemary. My mother looks at me, and for a moment I think she's going to cry, breaking down in tears over her lost baby. Or maybe, instead, she will tell me that it's okay to miss Rosemary. To be thinking about her all the time, the way I do. But she steals herself. Know what? She says, I think you should wear them tonight. She takes off the black pearls and fastens them around my neck. Thanks for reading with me today. If you liked this video, make sure to like and subscribe.